So thank you everybody for joining us for the 15th HISC Brown Bag uh, Lunchtime Webinar presentation. Today we have Chris Martin from the Coordinating Group on Alien Pest Species, and she's going to give a presentation on public awareness attitudes towards invasive species. Okay, we're going to get started. Um, so I have been with uh, working on invasive species since 2000, January of 2000. And I came to this job uh, from teaching and in uh, community outreach. And I have to say, you know, I thought it would be just this easy jump over to public awareness and, and outreach, but it's not. <laughs> because in teaching, you get this nice, um, solid bunch of students. They're assigned to you. They have an interest in learning what you have to say. You have an hour, usually, sometimes with the lab. I got four hours to get my point across. And that is not the world that we live in anymore. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to share with you some of my um, work. 50% of my job is uh, to conduct public outreach and to uh, coordinate outreach on invasives. So I'm going to share with you some of the uh, tracking tools that we've been using over the years to figure out if we're getting our messages across. So hopefully you, you folks will find this uh, at least somewhat interesting or useful. So going back a little bit further in history, uh, the, the Nature Conservancy of Hawaii and National Resources, uh, Resources Defense Council did a report that looked at Hawaii's invasive species programs, and they highlighted the gaps in the system. And that was done back in 1992. Uh, and what they found was that we have a lot of agencies working on it, uh, but they work in different jurisdictions. They've got different mandates, and so there's gaps between those. We have outdated laws or lack of laws, and that leaves more gaps. We have very little, we had at that point, very little ability to address uh, these issues with the current fund. We had no rapid response capacity at the time. Um, we had what little there was with the agencies, but we had uh, them constrained by mandates. They were only working on the things that they thought were issues. So we didn't have a general rapid response capability, and since then, I, I like to think that we've address that partially with it. We had no communication between the agencies or even sometimes with people sitting at next, uh, desks next door to each other. And that was a huge gap. And then one of the things that this uh, report looked at is what do people know and how can the public help? And they determined that there's, there's a low public awareness and involvement gap, so that was a huge one. This led to the formation of the group that I work for, CGAP. Uh, that acronym is uh, chosen on purpose. Uh, we see the gaps and we try to address them. Our mission is to coordinate and catalyze action amongst government and non-government partners to prevent or manage invasive species in Hawaii, as well as to communicate key issues to the public. That is a really long mission. Normally, we keep it very short, one sentence, one topic. But the steering committee found it so important to make sure we uh, continue to include the public that that got added to our mission as well. So half of my job is to work on that. We have three other staff people who work on policy and procedural issues. Um, so you have a half uh, one PTE <laughs> working on communication. So. Now we've done a lot of surveys. And when I first came to CGAP, there had already been a public awareness survey that was conducted, a professional awareness survey about invasive species. It was commissioned by the Nature Conservancy of Hawaii, and it was conducted by the Kitchens Group, which is a public awareness firm out of Florida. <laughs> so um, going through that 96 survey was interesting in a couple of ways. Um, I'll, I'll get into some of those little quirks a little bit later. I came on board in 2001 fall of 2001, and the first thing I tried to get a handle on is, well, what do people know and what do they not know? So where's our, where's our starting point? Are we even using the same language that people you know, understand? At the time, we were still using alien pet species, exotic species, non-native, introduced, uh, all sorts of things. And so one of the first things we did in 2003 was we conducted some focus groups. That's where you bring people into a room, you know, representative of, of the community. 
and you lead them through a discussion on, on what you'd like to know. And one of the things that they pointed out right away is that there's a lot of confusion about terms and that they preferred invasive species. We have since then done a number of telephone surveys. And again, these are professionally conducted surveys. And we usually do this via what they would call omnibus. And that is these companies run regular surveys. They have a, a, a bunch of people hired to call your house and ask you questions. And what you do is you can buy time in these omnibus surveys. If you want to just ask one question, you've got a burning question about something, you can buy time in an omnibus survey and have them ask it. That's the cheap way to go. We went the somewhat middle of the road way to go, and we usually collected about 10 or 12 questions, and uh, we bought time in those omnibus surveys. So we did that in 2004, 2006, 2007, 2012, and most recently in 2017. I got the results back in uh, November. Actually, it was probably October, and I sat on it for a while. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, a little bit more about the surveys. They're all phone surveys, except for the focus groups. That's in-person surveys. And they usually contain about 400 participants. The margin of error for this sort of survey is between uh, four percentage points and five percentage points with a 95% confidence level. That means you can be pretty sure that the answers that are averaged out that you'll see in just a moment are, are pretty correct. There's, it's 95% chance that that's exactly what the, the public is feeling um, to within about five percentage points. The surveys and the people that respond, they balance for male, female, ethnicity, income, length of residency, age, all of those things that could potentially make a difference. And I'll show you some slides later uh, where things do make a difference. At first, it was all landlines. And as we moved forward through time, we did more cell surveys, so calling cell lines. And the most recent survey was 17% landlines and 83% cell phones. And in fact, the company this year tried to convince us to go all computer route. Uh, and if anyone's interested in knowing what that entails, you can um, communicate with me afterwards. Uh, that's an interesting thing that, that this industry is heading towards and, and will we'll probably move toward. In, in some, maybe not right away. <laughs> I'm a, uh, not a fast adopter of technology. <laughs> so the survey results and information, I've posted the majority of the uh, the public reports on our website, and you can go see those anytime. I use data from some of the information that isn't necessarily public, um, and so those I don't post. And I also have not been able to get online to post this current uh, report. Forgive me, I'll, I'll try and get to that, um, hopefully later this week. Oh, I guess at least tomorrow, huh? Uh, <laughs> so let's get into some of the questions I ask. Now, me working for a partnership, I want to know how I can best help all of my partners. Some of the questions are very general. So this is one of them. We want to know, have you heard of the concept of alien pest species? And that's a 1996 question in order to continue its relevance and uh, its measurability against future survey results. We have to use those words somewhere in there. So I ask, have you heard of the concept known as alien pest species or invasive species? So you can see it started out pretty low, 1996, not even 29% actually is that number, had heard of this. It's gone up and up through the years. We've had a recent dip in 2017. I do not know why. I'm going to um, hopefully dig into some of the background data. I don't see a, a huge um, uh, smoking gun as to, to why that might have happened, but I've got a couple of theories. So we don't just want to know if they've heard of it, <laughs> you know, that's nice, but would you say it's a problem? And in fact, we ask them to categorize, do you think it's a very serious problem, which is the low bar, the very dark, uh, what I was trying to make purple, but the dark bar. And in 2004 was the first time we asked about the seriousness or how people considered it, whether it's serious or not a problem. So 2004 started off of about 37%. It goes up 2006, 2007. We're right about at the 40% mark in 2017. The good news about this 
is that people, the vast majority of people, think it's either very serious or somewhat serious. And when you think of all of the issues that people deal with in our lives, I'm not even sure if I were, if I were my parents, and now my parents are a somewhat educated audience at, at this point. <laughs> I'm not sure I would say very serious. I, I might, if I were my parents, say somewhat serious because I'm also framing that against homelessness, against the drug situation, against um, childhood education, uh, things like that. So um, I'm going to call it good that we have a pretty good um, platform to work on. My goal ultimately is to make sure that we don't have a growing proportion of people that say it's not a very serious problem or not a problem at all. So that's, that's <laughs> I hopefully we'll be able to achieve that as a, as a team here. So we also try to not just focus on sort of general concepts, but we have a, um, a sort of theory that people like to connect with different things. Like, we know this because the March of Dimes uses poster kids. They always post this, this kid, and, and it's their story, and you connect with it, and you give them their money that they need to be able to operate. But we think that also in nature, we have to have those emblematic poster species to be able to help tell stories. And so Brown Tree Snake has um, always, since the start of Sea Gaps, in fact, prior to that, been one of our emblematic poster species. 96 was the first time we surveyed on it. Uh, it was pretty high, surprisingly, at that point. But moving forward, we had some really high awareness, uh, upwards of 87% in 2006. It has dropped down since then. Um, I should note here a couple of things. CAPS conducts uh, television uh, campaigns. And we try to do a lot of print outreach as well. So we conducted television uh, ads featuring these issues and the brown tree snake and a bunch of these other poster species in, in ads. We ran them on all of the television stations. We ran that in uh, late 2004, 2006, and again, a little bit in 2007. So I don't want to say that that is exactly why we've had a bump. I mean, it's real nice. <laughs> if I were less of a scientist and more egotistical, I would say that that's what it was. But chances are there's other things going on. Um, other things that are going on, uh, we also did a real push with putting out press releases and stories throughout those years. Um, that has bumped down in CGAP's priorities these last two years, 2015, 2016, well, three years now, I can count, um, three years where uh, before, when I first started, uh, my goal was to average at least 10 press stories, press releases, or stories submitted to to major outlets a year. And I hit that point between 10 and usually 15 a year for all of those middle years. We were trying to hit all of the um, outlets that may be able to um, amplify our issues and just awareness. So, and again, I'm not taking any sort of claim for that being there, but I'm going to think twice about maybe reevaluating my, my pulling back on those um, press stories and I don't know. We'll see. Where, you at now? Where am I at now? I was at uh, two last year, 2017, two, which is pretty, <laughs> pretty bad. But um, so it's easy to beat that record. <laughs> um, another of our sort of legacy species, Myconia. Now, Myconia hit uh, the big time back in 1992. And 1993, 1994, uh, Governor Cayetano was really helping us, and I say us in the real general sense at this point, our predecessors, almost all of us. Uh, boy, Randy, you were up. <laughs> no, you were. You were, you were. Randy was there. He's he's our um, our longtime legacy awareness person. So he's been talking about Myconia for a while. I'm. Fairly surprised that awareness has stayed pretty high for Myconia, as high as it is. But look, we're still below 50%. It's going back down. We did have commercials about Myconia. Um, the Invasive Species Committees continue to do outreach about Myconia. 
but I think we probably need to do something more if we're hoping to um, get public awareness on this. So um, when you look at these numbers and you look 2017, geez, um, it's going down, it's like 40 something percent. And then you, you sit on an airline that shall remain nameless and you look through the magazine and you see an article about trying to protect Miley. And for those that aren't aware, the background that they've chosen to contrast that Miley Lay is Myconia leaves. I can say for sure that this photographer for this article on Miley is one of the 58% that have not heard of Myconia, <laughs> and perhaps this person's <laughs> editor. So that's, I mean, so there's science and surveys and all of that quantitative research, but this is a qualitative indicator that, um, yeah, we got problems. <laughs> we got to we got to step up the game on this one. Yeah, and it is beautiful. So I don't blame that photographer at all for using that. So um, I also want to know some things about um, things that are popular in the news. So we all have heard of rat longworm, and I want to know if the public had heard of it too, because it was in the news almost every single, well, certainly every week last year. Um, I wanted to know what the public understanding and retention of that is. And so this is pretty high. Hawaii Island, of course, is going to be the highest. Maui County is the second. But even on Oahu and Kauai, that message is getting out. I would say um, kudos to UH Hilo and uh, Hawaii Department of Health for that, as well as I know the ISCS and um, a whole bunch of us are, are working to where we can try to educate people. Having said this, media, the news media is very efficient at spiking awareness and it usually lasts for about a year or maybe two unless there's continued um, mentions in the news. We saw the same issue with Salvinia. That was the water fern that was covering Lake Wilson in um, Wahiwa. It is one of the reasons we can thank for the Hawaii Invasive Species Council because that issue was hitting every single day and legislators were saying, how can we work together better? Well, um, but despite the fact that it was on the front page for almost three months straight, <coughs> excuse me, that went down and down in awareness to about maybe under 20% really by year three after that event. And at this point, I don't even ask anymore in our awareness surveys. So um, my message to folks that if, if you're doing outreach and you need a long-term uh, awareness and continued participation, you have to continue to find ways to use uh, media. And I will show you in the, in the end where the best bang for your buck is if you have limited resources to hit the media. We also wanted to know, because some of our partners are really working hard on the um, issue trying to, to protect Hawaiian monk seals and possibly other species that are, you know, amazing and we want them around. Uh, have you heard of toxoplasmosis? So that's a disease that these animals can catch and that can kill them. And very low awareness. Now, if you have ever been pregnant, <laughs> uh, you will have read of this. This is why you cannot clean litter boxes for your cat because theoretically those uh, oocytes can get you know, aerated and you can smell it in and you can get transmission for toxoplasmosis. So it's interesting to me that a lot of older women should have heard of this. Um, and so I, I have a little note in my notebook to look at how people answered this particular question, male to female because all of my answers are divided up for who answered what. So I haven't done it yet. Maybe, maybe if I you know, provide some talks at the conservation conference, I'll, I'll have those um, dirty details in there. But despite the fact that you know, all men have to clean the litter box because <laughs> we're not doing it, and they theoretically would ask us why they're cleaning the litter box instead of us, um, <laughs> it's a really low awareness. Yeah, so if that's what we're messaging half, on, right? <laughs> half the population, half the population um, should have heard of this. So, so anyway, we 
we provide this information to our partners that are working on messaging for wine monk fuel production in different ways. I always clean the box. I appreciate Randy has said he always cleans the litter box. You're a rare breed, Randy. Um, we also try to help our partners when there's issues like rapid ohia death. And so we asked two questions this year particularly. Um, we that do outreach, uh, we're getting reports that, well, I, and I know this because I've done the outreach, people say, oh, what is OHEA? If they're not on the Big Island, they don't know what it is. And so we were hearing this and experiencing it as we're doing outreach, uh, you know, 2016 leading up to 2017, and people said, we really need to get a grasp on who knows what. Have you heard of OHEA? So that was our first question. So that is the dark bar. Uh, and indeed, people on Hawaii Island do know they are more aware. They've heard of OHIA. Uh, on the neighbor island, they largely have not. Um, and this is one of those questions where you take it with a slight grain of salt because everybody likes to seem like they know what they're talking about. So almost all of these that they have you heard of, I, I'd like to drop it automatically. Yeah, I think maybe 60, maybe 55% because there's that swagger factor. That's not a technical term, but <laughs> it's real. It exists. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that again? So <laughs> following that, I asked, have you heard of the disease called rapid ohia death that is killing ohia or ohia lehua? And um, that is the lighter bar. And again, Hawaii Island, yeah. they've heard of both. So we know that outreach there is definitely working. And we can clearly see that we need to do a lot of work for the other islands, particularly in preparation of if this ever shows up there, um, we're going to need a lot of help. Um, we've had some amazing public participation on Hawaii Island because everybody's aware. I just worry about that situation um, outside of the uh, island. We also help our partners um, with the things that they need to plan for. now. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service and DLNR are pursuing a new mosquito control technology, uh, in fact several technologies they're looking at, for the purpose of protecting native Hawaiian forest birds from avian malaria. That's a disease that's transmitted by Culex mosquitoes that bite um, infected birds and they can transmit it to Hawaiian forest birds or any other bird. The Hawaiian forest birds are amazingly susceptible. It thickens and usually kills them. And this is why we rarely see native forest birds uh, at the lowland areas where these Culex mosquitoes are, um, are, are numerous. This is the, the altitude or the warmth level at which these Culex mosquitoes can survive and continue to transmit the disease. So when you look outside and you see all of these non-native birds, a lot of them also have avian malaria. So we got a lot of Culex mosquitoes. They're biting these, uh, these alien birds. They're picking up that disease. And if, if we want to have native birds down where we live, we have to address that issue. So we know also that the projections from um, the USGS work uh, and Fish and Wildlife work looking at climate change that the mosquitoes and that disease transmission is going to expand and squeeze native birds out of their last remaining habitat. All right, long explanation, but that's why I'm involved and that's why I asked the next series of questions. So we wanted to know, and this was done in 2017, um, we have no native mosquitoes. They arrived on ships. How important or unimportant is it to control mosquitoes? All right, this flabbergasted me that people, that a lot of people said it was very important. I was shocked, <laughs> pleasantly shocked. That's really nice. Um, but of course, when you say things like this, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to approve your method. So that really gets to the heart of it, right? Okay, they're supportive. Fantastic. Um, makes me ask a couple of other questions, though. Here's a few more questions. Have you heard of avian malaria? If we're going to be talking about this, you have to, well, no, not so much. And again, this question, because malaria is similar to something that people have heard of, not so much avian malaria, I really give this the hairy eyeball. Um, it's lower than this, I guarantee you. People do not know what avian malaria is or what it means. 
So, but this clearly says that we need to do a lot of work anyway. Well, okay, how about other diseases? Have you heard of Zika? And yes, but we have, um, we've not done any concerted effort about Zika here. And when I looked back in the uh, records of, you know, who was men mentioning Zika over this past year, it was all international, sorry, national news media sources. So it was getting reported in the national news for international cases, and it was getting picked up locally. So um, another way <laughs> we can influence what people think and talk about would be through national um, media, but this is a little tough for a little old Hawaii. It's hard for them to pay attention to us. So other questions related. Well, can you name any native Hawaiian forest birds? If we're saying we're going to protect them and that we need to protect them, that we need to do this, have you heard of any? Can you name any? Uh, yeah, I like that 2% that said Mina. That, that amounts to eight people <laughs> said Mina. Um, now, and of course you folks know that some of these are not forest birds per se. I don't find so much of an issue of them saying, you know, things like, um, a plover, I, I don't mind, but if we're going to be messaging, maybe we should be saying, uh, maybe we should do some outreach about forest birds also. Um, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm happy that they could name any because 59% said no, they can't. That's a lot. And by the way, this is what they call unaided awareness, where you do not list any options for them. They got to come up with these things on their own. And not only that, they have to get reasonably close before the uh, the person who's marking or, or doing the questionnaire um, tallies it appropriately. So. so just out of curiosity, the person who works for Mark or whatever research or agency, they yeah. have a we provide them with a list of what we thought were going to be answers. And, um, you know, if it sounds like this, then that's probably what it is. And our partners, uh, particularly for who did this one, Word Research, uh, our partners are very good at training their staff. So they have a, a general training about the questions, about how to pronounce things, and all of that. It's, it's, it's why you choose good professional uh, survey companies to work with. All right. So again, we're, we need to tell them about climate change, that like climate change is the driver for why we need to do this, why we need to do it now. Um, I am very happy. This is the first time we've ever asked the state about climate change. Would you say climate change is a very serious problem, somewhat not a serious problem, not a problem at all? I'm very happy to say that people are not only aware, um, but they think it's a very serious problem. And you know. Kudos to Maui County for being up there and out front. I ran into Mayor Arakawa yesterday, and this was what he wanted to talk about. You know, I'm all invasive species. He's all, you know, planning and climate change. I'm like, okay, <laughs> right on, you win. You're the mayor. <laughs> um, and so, I, but I don't. It's it's the same thing, right? We're still working on trying to get people to change behavior so that we can do what we need to do to protect um, us and our way of life. So at least we don't need to teach them what climate change is uh, and, and that it's a problem. So then we get into the little hairy question. To reduce mosquito numbers and impacts, they're proposing to use what, I, what we have deemed a birth control technique. Um, have you heard of it before today? And most people have heard nothing. And so I've divided that out by island because um, the islands that are most at risk for losing their birds are the lower islands like Kauai. So it's most important that if we're going to do something, on, if we need to do it on Kauai to save those birds. So um, we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, Kauai, who, by the way, had th the highest amount of people that had heard something about it, which is appropriate because that's where some media came well, how would you rate your reaction to sterilizing and releasing male mosquitoes to reduce the numbers and impact? And this is um, a somewhat comfortable balance between totally comfortable 
and extremely concerned. Again, look at that Kauai one on the left side. They have the most people that are extremely concerned. And so you know that that's what we need to work on is to really communicate. And when I say communicate, it's not us talking, right? It's listening, um, which is the first step to communication. You listen to what are the concerns. Um, hopefully, they will invite you to share how, um, what you're planning or you know, where they can get involved or that sort of thing. So anyhow, get off the box. Tell you more about survey work. I can't help myself. Always a teacher. Um, so this gets to an interesting point. When you do your um, outreach, how do people get information um, on invasive species? And we've asked this a couple of times now. We want to track how things shift over time. And um, it, it requires a little bit of interpretation. So if you look at the dark bars uh, to the left of each of those, that's 2017. And so you look at TV and news programs, uh, high and, in fact, gaining, which is interesting. I'll go into that in just a minute. Something we know, um, websites and internet and apps and things like that are actually going up quite a bit, meteoric rise, in my opinion. Newspapers are going down in importance. And um, I don't circle back to this. Remind me to do it, because you don't want to ignore newspapers, um, friends, family, word of mouth, and I'm going to lump Facebook and apps into this, the younger generation doesn't differentiate between talking with a friend on Facebook, talking with a friend face-to-face, um, uh, -face, right? So there's a little bit of interesting thing going on here. Our take-home point for this is um, if you can generate people talking about it, then the more people talking about it, the more people will hear about it, right? So how do you get people talking about it? That's, that's your, your point. Radio is still um, holding its own. Facebook is going up. Of course, we know we didn't ask about any other apps. We were hoping to just lump that in, but it became such a standalone answer that they started logging it. So that's Interesting. Number one. It's number one. So um, I'll move on, and then and hopefully I'll, I'll remember to circle back around to that newspaper thing. I have a quick question yeah. about uh, how you differentiate newspapers from websites. I yeah. read a lot of newspapers, but I read them all online. Right, exactly. And that's that whole um, point. So I'll go into it right now then. Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. Um, it's a great nexus. Uh, question. So uh, for our purposes, it almost doesn't matter because websites are important and they're rising in importance. And websites typically, individual standalone websites don't generate their own information. They get it from newspapers. <laughs> so you don't ignore, just because it's 34% now and it's dropped from 53 you still need to send it to the newspaper because the radio picks up the newspaper, the radio picks up the TV news, um, and that's where websites get information. So you're still stuck with going your standard route of sending a press release or story to the newspaper, trying to engage your um, local journalists, trying to engage the television media for free uh, outreach. Um, and then wherever possible, supplementing them on websites so that people can pick it up. And I would say absolutely, if you're running any sort of social media, it should be Facebook. Right. Yeah, Instagram is actually rising in the state. Um, Twitter is coming up a bit. Um, Snapchat, strangely enough, is also coming up a bit. Snapchat's not useful so much for our purposes, which is long-term education, kind of. Um, the return on the expenditure time spent isn't there for Snapchat or things like that. Uh, maybe for Instagram, sure. Yeah, well, Facebook owns Instagram, yeah. so it's tied in. Mm -hmm. It's pretty easy to integrate those to anywhere. Yeah. You might as well, if you're doing one, you might as well do the other. Yeah. Well. <coughs> All right, digging in a little bit more. So when you look, though, at the ages of people for television programming, um, the dark gray, it used to be blue, um, where's or where there's a significant, a statistically significant difference. So 
So you are looking at, for people 55 and over, you're going to hit them via television. That's what they're doing. They're not out partying on a Friday night. They're home watching the news, <laughs> watching all this, all the other crazy people get into accidents. That's what they're doing. Um, same with the people raising kids, uh, 35 to 54. They're watching TV. Um, and they're watching, uh, strangely enough, the, the most important thing you could do if you're going to make a news uh, program, if you can hit either the 6 o'clock news, um, Joe Moore is still popular, <laughs> or the 10 o'clock What You News Now, those are your top two for viewership. Man, you get a lot of attention on those two particular things. And I don't want to leave out um, the KITV folks or, or any of the other outlets, but, um, but at this point, they, you know, the 10 o'clock news has almost double the viewership. So um, looking at websites and internet and apps and things like that. That's raising, uh, that's, that's all carried by 18 to 54 year olds. We know this, right? But as, and here we go, I'm, I'm gonna get out and put my educator hat again. Uh, and my personal experience hat, in fact. Um, we absolutely need to make sure we remember that when we put out our outreach materials via website, internet, um, that sort of thing, that our platforms are consumable by those over 40. That means no light gray fonts, um, Calibri, if you're using that fancy font that people love now, the young generation, they usually use it in 11 or lower. You absolutely have to hit it at, at least um, 12 or 14 would be ideal. So um, there's an easy way to test this. You can ask me to read it if I can't read. <laughs> <laughs> Find your local experienced uh, <laughs> outreach person and, and <laughs> ask them to tell you if, you, if, if it's good or not. Um, I will clearly, you'll see me back away from something. <laughs> um, but you know that you know, as we move forward, this generation shifts, and so they're going to carry that internet website app thing with them. So it takes us so long to build things. That build it now, man, build it now, build it right. All right, and the newspaper we know is all carried by the older generation. And radio. We also um, want to know, uh, this was not done in 2017, this was a 2012 question, but it helps with planning. So we want to know, how likely are you to report something and in what way? So people said that they're very likely to report a snake. Yeah, like 90% likely. And they're very likely to use the phone to do it. This is a different question. How about an unusual singing ant? You know, they're pretty slow. <laughs> Not like a snake, right? So is there a different urgency? The answer is yes. They are half as likely to report something. And not only that, they very greatly in how they prefer to report it. So um, when you look at this, they're starting to prefer websites more, and that blue one in the front, that's the younger generation, 18 to 34 year olds. They're less likely to pick up a phone, they want to write stuff, and this is one of the reasons why, um, or one of the reasons, and one of the pieces of information that we uh, provide for the report of text, um, online reporting, platform, which is live, by the way. It's now called uh, 643test.org, um, I think. All righty. Other partners, Way Department of Agriculture wanted to know, and this was in 2012 also, how did people feel about biocontrol? They got beat up for the strawberry guava biocontrol, but was that a case of a few people being extremely vocal? Um, yes. I believe that, yes, that's what that was. So strongly support, somewhat support, you lump those two together and you got people that aren't gonna march in the streets against you. So right on that. Yeah. And this is something that we asked this year. Would you support increasing, and boy, I had a hard time with this question. Wording it was tough. Would you support increasing the annual allocation of state budget for invasive species prevention and control? So 
So key agencies there are the ones that are the HIST agencies, Prevention, Hawaii Department of Agriculture, Hawaii Department of Health, um, partially DLNR for Division of Applied Resources, uh, and then control work are, uh, you folks know the mix, uh, also partially Hawaii, uh, those agencies as well. Would you support increasing the uh, percentage of the state budget so that by 2027, this work receives at least 3% of the annual state operating budget? And it's worded this way because the interagency biosecurity plan is a 10-year plan. And our goal is to increase, well, one of them, is to increase the amount of support going to these agencies via not just people but technology and for, for putting in place the things we need to do. Um, and your plan ends in 2027. Thank heavens, most people said yes. Um, that is something I think we should take to the legislature. Uh, when you look at it slightly differently, you look at it by island, Maui, county, you win, you win the race again. Go Maui. Um, and I do think that they've done a really good job of uh, doing outreach. It's, it's working there. They have, they have a lot of support for this work, and it clearly shows. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Let's look a little bit, though, um, at some of those numbers. So if you were to separate only Oahu out of neighbor islands, neighbor islands, they're like, we got to do this, man. <laughs> and it's Oahu where the most people live that aren't so convinced. Yet, that's where the majority of the legislators, that's where their constituents are. Dang, right? So we now we gotta make sure we focus on Oahu raising awareness here. When you look at some of those invasive species issues, you know those standalone questions I asked earlier. Um, a lot of those neighbor islands for awareness of the species are super high on the neighbor islands because they have them. <laughs> yeah. So um, and then something that was really interesting to me. And, well, it is the age. I thought that the people 55 and over were going to be the ones that were going to support more funds. Um, I'm glad to say it's over 50%. You know, 57 is not enough to, to, to say poo-poo uh, at. Uh, but look at those 18 to 34-year-olds, 83%. Now, it could be a little bit of naivete. <laughs> They don't know exactly what all this means, but it sounds good. But I have, I have hope, right? Um, there's an opportunity. They think that that more should go towards this work, and I want to think that um, they think it's important. So um, again, I will dig into. Yeah, they do. Why don't people ever give millennials any credit? A little bit more. They'll have more on that for you later. So. Right, the older voters because they got the time on their hands to call their legislators, but don't ignore <laughs> into 34 year olds, man. <laughs> Show up at Green Dream. Um, and just thank you, thank you so much. Um, a lot of people help put the questions together. I shop around questions for a few months before we actually run them. And so everybody just about has helped me word a few questions uh, at some point. And then thank you again to the agencies that fund the work. Um, so Nature Conservancy, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Hawaii Invasive Species Council, and this most recent work, uh, 2017 survey, was funded by Ha'oli Maluwa.